looks like a policy book. Yeah. It is a policy book, but it comes from Bob's deep heart and caring and his love of people. With the conventions this week, I've been watching last week. I'm aware of the intense sense that it's about tribes. It's about belonging. It's about being part of something. And almost the intensity, the content is irrelevant. People want to belong. And one of the things that happens when people have a sense of belonging is they often feel better. You know, there's a whole subset of data that says an awful lot of visits to doctors are by lonely people who don't have any other place to go. And so I thought about that intensity, and I thought about all the chatter on both sides about health, whatever you want to call it. Um, I wonder what time, where are you, Morris? There you are, can you hear? Good. Morris walked in today and handed me this from Hopkins. Hop Morris is my emissary who brings for 20 years now, you've been bringing me quotes from what Hopkins is doing. So he comes in and he hands me this that you picked up yesterday? Day before yesterday. Day before yesterday at Hopkins. This is about uh, some part of Hopkins, the Department of Behavior and Health is founded to research and create behavioral programs that promote wellness in society. It is estimated that more than half of all illness, injury, and mortality is behavior related. That's exactly the point of the book. They wrote that in 2005, but it's still not happening. And um, thank you for bringing it. I collect these because it's surely the intention of our society. Um, this is a little digression, but thanks to you, it's here. Um, do you know how to get teenagers to stop smoking? Those of you who've heard me do this before don't say. Anybody know the most effective way to get teenagers to not smoke? Acupuncture? <laughs> could be, could be. No. And we tell teenagers it's dangerous, it's bad for your health, it's not good for you. <clears throat> the most effective way to have a teenager not smoke is to tell them they will get kissed more if they don't have that smell on their mouth. That is the single most effective way, because it's a real-time payoff to a real-time shift in behavior. It is not about, I'm going to run today so I don't die 20 years from now. Okay. Welcome. Come on in. Oh, great. Hi. Welcome. So, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to do, because... I'm not going to tell you what's in the book. We want to sell the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do a quiz on the book in a couple of weeks. Um, so I don't want to do the content of the book. But I do want to start by saying that um, I ask a particular listening from you. So as you're listening to what I'm saying, I'd like you to be listening for who should have this book. $1.2 trillion in the U.S. economy is going to shift how it is spent. Has to shift. And there are good financial reasons for shifting it. Some companies, some large companies initially, are going to make a fortune when they pay attention to this. It's already happening. If you look at the flap of the book, uh, Dow Chemical, the global uh, director of health for Dow Chemical, Catherine Baze, has turned Dow Chemical's health care for their employees around so that that health care cost is now declining and they're returning 10 cents a share to the bottom line. That is making Dow Chemical a very attractive, competitive chemical company in the United States for very, nothing to do with they don't care when, well, I don't have to. Catherine cares about wellness and health. But the bottom line is driving this. The bottom line is driving it. So listen, who do you know or have access to in large systems or corporate America that would like to make a lot of money and take it away from going to the pharmaceutical companies, 
and the hospitals and move it over into employee benefits, employee salaries, or corporate profits. And that's the part that Ivan would spin. Mm -hmm. Several of Ivan's other students, when they read drafts of the book, said, Ivan would never approve of you giving a capitalist solution to this. <laughs> and I said, yes, he would, because it's, it's just shifting where it's going in the capital system. I'm not about to take on fighting that. But I ask you listening, for who do you know in corporate America, in high levels of government, who want to make a lot of money by employing already documented principles? So that's the first thing. That's the listening I'd like. Um, I say this to a lot of top political leaders, and I never am questioned about it. America is going bankrupt, not because of our deficit, not because of all the things we talk about. It's going bankrupt because health care is exploding at about 6-7% per year. Now, I heard a statistic the other night at the convention 4% for the past two years. But every time there's been a move to do health care reform for a year or two, it drops. 4% is still above inflation. We're now, as a nation, spending 17% or more of our gross domestic product somewhere in the health care world. 17% of GDP. Now, if you look at the other countries on the planet, the nearest one is 11%. Most developed countries are spending about 9% of GDP on health care. American companies are sinking under the cost of health care. I was talking to a group of top executives at a major company the other day, and they were looking at how to cut costs. And I was invited in to give a, a, a talk um, and I said to them, you're spending eight, they have thousands and thousands of employees, you're spending $8,000 per employee for health care. 4,000 of those dollars are pure, pure, unadulterated waste. Everybody agrees with it. You know, you said to me today, and you're a doctor by background, so you know this, and you're an acupuncture. You said the interesting part of the book is it's all well documented. What's in the book, nobody argues with. So if you're a company and you're spending $8,000 or a state agency and you're spending $8,000 for each employee's health care, literally 4,000 of that is pure waste. How do you get that out of the system? 2,000 employee wage increase and 2,000 to the bottom line. Doesn't make any difference. Everybody now agrees that that money in the system is pure waste. When you talk 17% of our gross domestic product, that's $2.6 trillion annually. $2.6 trillion annually. At a very conservative estimate by many, many think tanks, 1.2 trillion of that is the cost of the waste. And it's probably higher than that. So essentially, we would have no national deficit if we shifted that money to another column. And most of that burden is carried by our corporations, making them less profitable, less competitive, and less able to deal in an international world. There's, there's Mary Ellen. Oh, I'm so glad. There's the lady who's responsible for the book. She's coming in the back door. <coughs> Hi, Mary Ellen. Hello. Hi, Margaret. There's the man who keeps her patient enough to deal with me. Okay, so we're spending a lot of money. And we could say, some people could call it waste, some people could call it benefit. The outcome of that, though, in CIA data, this is data from the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, is the United States ranks 50th in the world in longevity. 50th in the world in longevity. 
while paying twice as much as any other community on the planet. So we don't even get the simplest outcome in longevity. When you go to most other outcome statistics on wellness and health, the United States ranks 39th. We do not, we are not anywhere in a high performing healthcare system. We're paying twice as much and ranking way below some underdeveloped countries in the actual well-being and quality of life of our citizens. And that is growing at a rate that's far beyond inflation. It's predicted within a few years it will be at 20%. As Jade mentioned Yvonne's book, Medical Nemesis, his projection is there, says that a culture that wants to avoid death and that's about 800 billion a year in the United States preventing death. In other words, enhancing suffering in the last six months of life. That's about 800 billion. Attempting to prevent death. Iman says a culture that focuses on preventing death will spend itself out of existence because it has to build to 100% because you can't prevent death. So the United States has a national entity has a set of insane, clearly insane, preventing debt at a cost and yet arriving with an outcome that ranks 50th in the world in longevity. So I'm not going to say more about that. It's well documented in the book that this is what's going on. Um, and now we've added access to it. So now we're going to put 45 million more people into the system that wasn't able to cope with the people who were in it. And the reality is we're already paying for health care for those folks, except we pay for it when it gets to crisis stage. So none of it makes sense. Now, what, what's the cause of that? We're relatively rational people, and one of the things that got me started on this book years ago was the concept of an iron triangle. For anybody who works in policy, um, this is a pretty standard term for when there are triangulations about changing a policy. And so in healthcare, breaking the iron triangle, the triangle is we want access for everybody, access for everybody at the absolute highest quality so that nobody ever dies. And we want it at a cheap cost. And that conversation has gone on for the past 40 years in American public policy. How do we create total access for everybody? How do we maximize absolute quality at very low cost? Well, everybody in the family knows you can't do that. You have to compromise somewhere in that equation. And so it doesn't work. But there's a huge fallacy and when I look at the political conversations, everybody's winning. And we have, well, Ezekiel Emanuel, who is a brother of Ram Emanuel, and who is an NIH official, now at Dartmouth, a very well-respected doctor. Ezekiel wrote in the Journal of the American Medical Association four years ago, what must politicians stop saying? This is the Journal of the American Medical Association. He says in that article, um, politicians have to stop saying we have the best medical system in the world. And if you listen in the past weeks or any of the debates, it's repeated. And they say it as if they must believe it. <coughs> you do not. That's the facts. And Ezekiel just did an article in the New York Times, an op-ed, saying by the year 2020, and this is unbelievable, and I know it's true, there will be no insurance, there will be no health insurance companies. They will all be gone within eight years. So there's some fantasy land that goes on. Now when you have one of these iron triangles, they exist because somebody's not asking the right question. Anybody got a clue where the fallacy is? If you've read the book, don't speak up. <laughs> Most of the people don't belong in that healthcare system at all. We have everybody in that system, but it really has to downsize because it's really only needed. 
maybe 70 to 30 percent of the people. You can move 70 percent of the people into self-care. People learning to take care of themselves. Nobody said that. It's not thought of. We want to put everybody into the system. You getting the point here? We have an enormous national catastrophe predicated by the wrong question. We spent today in class, it's like um, those of you who were there, we spent part of the time talking about when there's a problem, there are always two options, small mind or large mind. This conversation going on in the smallest possible mind. So I'm going to leave that for a minute and just say, how did we get to that? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. There's a report in 1908 funded by the Carnegie Foundation, the Rockefeller family and others. It's a report called the Flexner Report. At the time that report was written in 1908, half the members of the US Congress were homeopaths, a wholly different form of medicine. Half of the members of the US Congress were also homeopaths in 1900. There were many schools, different schools of healing arts. And there was a concern about quality. As, as recent as 1885, most of the students in medicine at Harvard couldn't read or write. It's quite amazing. You can go back and read the minutes. They're debating whether to make sure they know how to read. But by 1908, this report is issued. And by 1920, all of the other traditions of wellness and healthcare have disappeared. So the simple version, and you can read it in the book, is that we have a monopoly. We don't see it because we think we see hospitals and insurance companies competing. But they're all competing within a monopoly. The monopoly says that when you have a headache, you take enough drugs to get rid of it. There's no competing monopoly that says when you have a headache, maybe you need to go to bed. There's no competition to that economic strategy. And so if you, if you can stand it, sit down some evening, turn on the evening news about 5.30 and watch till 9, and watch how many diseases you can be told you have, and how many automatic cures you can buy, then go out and buy them all, and then we have all the complications from the system. I don't have time to go down that route. And I don't see any of this was with, done with evil intention. My leg works because the surgeon and an anesthesiologist put it back together. You survived when you were quite sick because a wonderful neurologist helped you. There's no opposition here to the medical system. It's just out of proportion to what we need. Imagine if 70% of the people learned how to do it in other ways. Imagine the time doctors would have to listen. What's the number one complaint in the American healthcare system? Nobody listens. And then we follow it up by saying, no doctors have been trained how to listen. So even if they had the time, they don't know what to listen for. And they're only in the mode of you do surgery or you do drugs. A, a simple, it showed up today somewhere in class. Um, oh, I know somebody was talking about her son who died of drug addiction. And the woman standing next to her mentioned a child with AD, ADHD. And I said to them, well, with children who have ADHD now, we give them a drug. They prescribe Ritalin. So they get that at seven. They learn how you cure a problem is with a pill. So by 15 or 16, it's very natural. They want a drug to solve whatever is going on. And yet there's enormous worldwide data that says if you take a child who's ADHD, New York City is capitalizing on this. You take a child who's been labeled in the seven in the seven-year-old labeled hyperactive, and you teach them to breathe and some yoga stretches, their learning curve goes up, and they become absolutely integrated. You're nodding because you know this, don't you? Uh, so we have a monopoly, and now that monopoly has gotten to a point where it's out of control. 
and yet we're not even realizing it's a monopoly. Um, I have a dear friend, Norton Hadler, the man who sent me the quote about moral philosophy. A physician is a moral philosopher. In essence, somebody who's teaching us the laws of nature, how to live. Norton is one of the <coughs> most prestigious American physicians. Um, he's a professor at the University of North Carolina. He has published about 15 books. He just got his newest one this week on aging. Um, he was head of the American Rheumatological Association, published regularly in JAMA and in the New England Journal. Um, I asked the dean at Penn, when I first read one of Norton's books, I said, uh, what do you think of this guy Norton Hadler? I hadn't met Norton at that point. And I said to the dean at Penn, the man who runs the whole health system at Penn, uh, I said, Arthur, what do you think of Norton? He said, I've been trying to get him to move from UNC to Penn for the past 10 years. The man is an absolute genius. And so I actually got Norton come up to Penn with me. And we had, I had Norton present what he says. And here's what Norton basic message. And again, nobody at Penn argued with him. Nobody in the healthcare system argues with him. Penn has, Norton has a book called The Last Well Person. Norton Hadley, The Last Well Person. First chapter. He and I go back and forth right now. He, he said when he read this book that he's with kindred spirits on the same mission. He said, um, so chapter one of Norton's book is, hey folks, get over it, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to live to 85 if you learn how to live. But you're going to die. So don't worry about it. Chapter two in Norton's book. The most dangerous thing you, this is a doctor, the most dangerous thing you can do before 85 is go to a doctor and ask them how you are. Never, ever, ever do that. <laughs> because they will tell you how you are, and then you are made into a patient. Get that? Now, the Canadian system has banned annual physicals for about 20 years, because it is well documented, they're dangerous. They create the worry, which creates the testing, which creates the drugs, which creates more complication than any benefit. There's a lot of research on this. And in the US, we also know that, it's been recommended over and over again, that there is no documented outcome from the annual physical exam. No benefit. But then the real kicker in Norton's book, he then has the next 12 chapters. And the next 12 chapters take every one of our major preventive testing, from mammograms to cholesterol to PSA, and we have all 12 of them. And he documents statistically there is absolutely zero benefit in terms of longevity or quality of life. The danger in them far outweighs any minuscule benefit. And it's well documented. And I brought Norton up, he spoke at Penn with a very prestigious group and zero argument. What got very clear that evening was if you stop the testing, the economic system collapses. So that's the background of where we are. We have this impossible conundrum. We're in enormous national political danger. If we think we're in trouble now, unless something is done to change this, then by 2016, the next election will be out of control. Because whatever you do with the budget, it's just, there's no way to cap healthcare expenses in the present conversation. So what is the possibility of changing this? <coughs> Let me, let me do this one piece first. Um, there are four, Jade mentioned it, there are four cherished assumptions in our healthcare system. One of them is death is to be avoided at all costs. If you talk to physicians, their task is to keep life living. Death for them is a failure, and they will say it to you quite clearly. That is the root of their training. Okay. Another cherished assumption is that we should have no suffering or pain. So the goal of healthcare 
is to prevent all suffering and pain. How many of you have gotten through life with no suffering and pain? It doesn't exist. It's an unreal world. And there's a whole history behind each of these. I'm not going to attempt tonight. I'll do more of it on Saturday the 29th for those of you who are interested. So I think it's important for some folks to go deep and understand it. The third assumption, totally, you've been, heard it now for 40 years. Do not do anything without consulting an expert. Always consult an expert. I'm a licensed acupuncturist, but I've been told by regulators that if I tell you to drink more water, I'm practicing nutrition without a license. And so I can lose my license for practicing outside of my scope of practice. So I'm not telling you to drink more water. Don't drink more, I can't tell you not to drink water either. <laughs> so we have an expert dependency. The whole culture has been told, be dependent on an expert. And then the fourth assumption, and these are historically rooted in 400 years, the fourth operating assumption is that your behavior has nothing to do with your biology. What you think, how you behave, all of that is disconnected from your biology. That's just crazy. But it is the fundamental design of every clinical trial. It's the fundamental design of double-blind studies. It's the, double, it's the fundamental design of every drug we give out. The CDC says, this is the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, says that if every American started getting one more hour sleep a night, half the hospital beds in America empty within a couple of weeks. We're an exhausted nation. And we're spending $2.6 trillion a year coping with that. Is that a little insane? Am I losing it? Or is it? I'm sorry, this is the bad news. The good news is coming. And so, what do we do? I'm going to read exactly what Dow Chemical has done. I've been saying this for 20 years, I guess, in different ways. And I spoke at Senate hearings in 09. And the person next to me on the panel was Catherine Bazzi from, um, from Dow Chemical. And this is a quote from her in 09. And the data I talked to her recently is much better now. The role of employers in improving public health has received minimal attention in discussions of health care reform, even though the potential for achieving large-scale health and economic impact among working-age adults is undeniable. By 2013, we anticipate we will have saved Dow Chemical a cumulative 420 million dollars over the past 10 years and will contribute in 2011, they, they did last year, contribute 10 cents a share to the bottom line. Most corporations, and I met you may know this, but people who run large corporations think of the benefits office as a profit loss. That's just losing. You're just putting out benefit costs. It's just the cost of doing business. Essential message of this book is you can turn a human resource center into a profit center, and a huge profit center. The people at PepsiCo got it the other day when I was talking to them. $4,000 per employee for the one area saved? That's a huge contribution. Did you have an offering? No, I just think the question from talking about the medicine with race, it's difficult to separate medicine from the legal system. Yes, the whole part. There's a whole section in the book because you're absolutely right. Most of the testing is done for legal reasons, right? We're trapped in this fear base. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, we're trapped. So the doctors do the testing because they're in a panic. So you can't change that. And one of my points in the book is I, and I, I think it's insane to come at the healthcare system. You can't, forgive me, I know you worked it. You can't change it. I tried that. And to be very honest with you, Herman, the dean at Penn said came back to me after five years of collaboration. So we can't do anything because we have the world chopped up into your brain, your toe, 
your heart, your ankle. There is nobody at Penn who's willing to have a conversation about how it all goes together. He was despairing. But what have they done at that chemical? They haven't done anything. They let their doctors go do what they do. They let the, all of that stuff go on. They, they have well, any testing you want, go for it. And they're adding a wellness culture. Not a culture to prevent disease, but simply let's have fun. There was a Harvard professor spoke to a group of Maryland, Howard County CEOs about three years ago, and I had helped organize this thing through the Horizon Foundation. And um, a wonderful doctor from Harvard, and she was invited in to talk to the CEOs about, about 100 CEOs in the room. Talk to them about wellness, wellness for their employees. And I hadn't met her, I didn't know her, somebody else had done the arranging. But I'm in the audience listening. And she's giving this very standard cancer, diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, what are the other three or four? There are three or four, they're all the major costs of healthcare. And she's talking about them. And then she concludes by saying, towards the end, she says, now look, we now understand every one of these major diseases is at root an inflammatory disease. They all have a common base. They are all inflammatory. They are all based on stress. If you want to save some money, you have two choices. As an employee, you can keep paying this insane insurance premium, paying for the hospitalization, pay for the treatment of the diabetes, pay for all this. You want to change the whole game, take the inflammation out of your workplaces, decompress the workplaces. Whatever investment you do into reducing the stress in the workplace, you will make back in fortunes by the lack of hospitalizations and medical care. That's what Catherine has done. And that's what she's doing from my point of view, from what we're talking about, is very primitive. You take wellness so that this workshop I'm doing on a person getting to know how their body works, paying attention that every symptom has a meaning, and people begin to say, and oh, we have lots of data on this, I now understand how my body works. I don't need to go for a physical to find out how I am. So the data is all there. One of the chapters in the book describes something called the blue zones. You know the blue zones? Anybody read the book? The blue zones are, you've read it, thank you, Robert. Um, about eight places on the planet with extreme longevity. So these people went around and looked at how these people live. One of them is Ojai, California, center of the Adventist church system, which is based on natural food and good exercise and simple living. The payoff is enormous. There's no great mystery about how to do this. It's well documented. A couple of more corporate examples. And then I have one more thing, and then I'm going to be quiet and we'll have a conversation. The head of GE, Jeffrey Eimelt, who's the head of the President's uh, Commission on Employment. Um, Mr. Eimelt, speaking in Cincinnati last year, said that by the year 2020, he would not be able to hire, they have a lot of factories in that area, make a lot of light bulbs and other things in the Cincinnati area. He said by the year 2020, GE will not be able to hire a single employee to work in any of the plants by 2020. Why? Because everybody in the area, 100% of the economy would be consumed in healthcare, either as patients, as doctors, as lawyers suing the system, lawyers defending the system, the whole thing would collapse so that GE could not be functional in Cincinnati. Stop and think about that. He's saying the same thing. We're about to bankrupt the entire nation of this. Safeway has done that. I, the data on Safeway gets a little more squishy, but I just saw it again the other day. They're doing something similar to Dow Chemical. They've changed the approach to their employees. The cost of their care is dropping. That cost is being reinvented, reinvested in salaries. Head of the Cleveland Clinic, head of the Cleveland Clinic, has done this with all the employees of the Cleveland Clinic. I remember 30 years ago when one of the doctors working with us put a wellness program into Union Memorial 
It was there for a year, and then it was gotten rid of. Why was it gotten rid of? Well, there was some, some explanation, but the bottom line reason was the amount of surgery in the building dropped. Because people were learning how to be well. And I had, I mentioned this in the book, recently I was privileged to spend an afternoon with the top executives of one of the largest insurers in the United States, 80 million people. And I was talking to the medical director. And he asked me what I was doing, and I spoke about wellness. Very nice man, very, very nice man. I think very well intentioned. And he said, Bob, we tried wellness in two communities. Almost forced us to close the hospitals. We had to stop the wellness. <laughs> now, on the highest level, he probably means closing those hospitals is 8,000 people unemployed. But the principles are now all there. That we can teach folks to recover how to live well. A lot of it is very simple. Do you sleep? Do you breathe? Do you know how to breathe? I say this all the time. Most Americans have never learned how to breathe. They're doing shallow breathing like they're about to give birth. And no idea of deep breathing. Do you drink enough water? I mean, do, you, do you exercise? Not exercise like killing yourself for the sake of preventing death. <laughs> Pleasure. And the solution to the healthcare crisis is literally that simple. I propose in the book, I mean, one of the simple ways of saying this is and this was taught to me by Ted Kapchuk from Harvard many years ago. When you fight a disease, the person is in a fight. When you expand the range of joy, they know how to expand the joy and they cure the disease. So I proposed in the book, I'd love to be able to do this myself, but Susan won't let me write the check, okay? I think there should be hundred, someone in a large corporation should offer like an X-Prize, $100 million to the first entrepreneurs that take on a large company and over a period of three, I think it's three, four years, they cut the cost of healthcare in the company by 10% and stop all the inflation. They create better attendance, better employee retention. I figured this out for Apple. I looked at the number of employees Apple has. And I knew this because they were sitting at that point on $100 billion in cash. So uh, $100 million was not a small change. If Apple took and offered that prize to whomever as an entrepreneur, venture capitalist, here's $100 million will invest, go into a company, could be the state health department. I proposed this to the Secretary of Health. I go to the health department and simply deliver wellness to all the employees. The cost of health care for that corporation, like Apple, if they did this, it would drop so significantly that they would get the $100 million back in three years and have that as a permanent income stream. That's how radical the data is. And it's not doing away with the health care system. It's right-sizing the health care system. So that 70% of Americans learn to breathe, sleep, eat right, come to wisdom well, for dancing and yoga and whatever else, and having a good time, and we use the medical system appropriately. So I ask your listener, who wants that hundred million? Or which corporation is willing to offer that hundred million so they can make all that money back and become famous? What's actually happening in this proposal is we're taking a hundred, one point two trillion dollars out of the pharmaceutical medical system and putting it into people feeling them. And that's, everybody agrees that's what has to happen. And it's not going to happen by going to government and saying shift it. This is not a government-based issue. This has to be done by entrepreneurs and large corporations like Dow Chemical, like GE, who are seeing the possibility for self-survival they have to do this. So. I've committed myself to making myself available for this conversation, and I'm asking you, if you know somebody who should have this book, be sure they get it. One of our students said to me today she'd given three copies to the top leadership of a major national union, because they stand to make a fortune by doing this. 
So I'm going to stop. Do we have some time? Yeah, we have some time. So is there any conversation? Am I making any sense? Am I crazy? Um, and this is pure Ivan, by the way. Looking at an issue, and what Illich did was always say, what question is not being asked? What's the assumption that everybody's running on? So I'm going to give credit to my mentor.